Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Paul Dodds. <clears throat> I'm from the UCL Energy Institute. Uh, maybe if I give you a little bit of background about myself first. So my first degree, I'm a physicist. And after that, I worked for a little while in the nuclear industry and a little bit in consultancy. I then, I then did a PhD in tropical agronomy, of all things, looking at crops and climate change in West Africa. And these days, I work as an economist, or kind of on the boundary between engineering and social science looking at e economic modeling of energy systems and trying to understand how we achieve a low carbon energy system essentially in the cheapest way possible and, and what the transition might look like. And one of the main areas of interest that I have is hydrogen. So we've done quite a lot of work on hydrogen, on trying to model hydrogen systems and trying to understand how hydrogen fits into the wider picture as we go towards a low carbon world. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. My question is, what happened to the hydrogen economy? And you might think that the picture I've got behind me is a bit odd if we're talking about hydrogen energy, but actually what happened to hydrogen was it disappeared out of our energy system in around the 1970s, and pretty much all of the hydrogen we use in the world today is, is, is used to make ammonia for plants, which goes very well with my PhD. But if we go back a little bit, we find that hydrogen had a very early entry into our energy system, or what we think of the energy system today. It first became mainstream. I'm going to pick the date of, 20, of 1812 as the year when it first became mainstream. And that was because the Gas, Light, and Coke Company was incorporated in 1812 in order to, provi to provide street lighting, so public lighting in London. And it did that using town gas. So the gas was town gas. It was made from coal gasification had a number of byproducts as well, which were very important for the economic case. But the there was two fundamental reasons, and, and we, we keep coming back to these all the time when we think about hydrogen in the future as well. There was an economic reason. So until then, whale oil had been used, and town, ga town gas was around a third of the price of whale oil. And so there was an economic reason for this. And secondly, there was a quality of service reason, because you got a brighter and a safer flame using town gas than you did using whale oil. And I should say town gas was about 50% hydrogen. So it was a mixture of hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, but it was around 50% hydrogen. And this was a huge success. So in 1812, the first company was incorporated. By 1820, there was widespread adoption of street lighting across the country, across the UK. So in only eight years, there was several hundred companies, a couple of hundred companies, some privately owned, some municipally run by local councils. And it, it caused a social revolution, actually. I mean, that's a little bit of an aside. But until then, it, in most places, it was very dark at night, and people would not go out because it wasn't, they thought it wasn't safe. And once you had street lighting, people would go out at night. And so it, it really changed what people could do. And so th this is how hydrogen was used. And so it was part of town gas from around 1812 until about 1875, when it started also to be used for cooking in many houses. But also in about 1875 or 1880-ish, we started getting electric lighting developed. And so you might think electric lighting is what we use now. It's, it's, much more, it's a much better technology than gas in order to provide lighting. Well, well actually, it's quite surprising if you look at the statistics about how, much, uh, how long it took for electric lighting to overtake gas lighting in, in the UK. So here, here's uh, from 1920 onwards. So, so 1920, is, we're already 40 years after electric lighting for street lights has been demonstrated. 40 years later. And still we have almost none in 1920. And it wasn't until the 1950s when electric lighting really started to replace gas lighting in the UK. So the, the, the changeover where electric, electric lighting began to dominate wasn't until about 1960. So I think 80 years after electric lighting was first demonstrated. But again, it was an eco economic reasons. Gas was still very competitive even after electricity became available. And then pretty soon after that, Hydrogen disappeared out of our gas system altogether because in 1959 we, we discovered natural, uh, natural gas in the North Sea. And then it, we pretty quickly tested it in homes, worked out how to extract it. And in about 1965, 1966, the decision was made to convert the whole of the UK from town gas to natural gas. The program started in 1967 and completed in 1977. So here's an example in Westminster, burning off the town gas. 
And that also caused quite a change in terms of how we use gas, because until then, town gas was rather expensive for heating, so people tended to use coal. When natural gas became available, natural gas was much cheaper, and so heating became the primary market for natural gas. And we greatly increased our gas consumption. The, the graph at the bottom shows you how in 1960, we had 10 gigajoules per customer per year. And in 1980, with natural gas, we were up to about 70 or 80. That's heating. Now, when we think of hydrogen today, we tend to think of transport. And hydrogen has been used in transport before, and it, probably more infamously than anything else. So on the left-hand side there, we have the Hindenburg disaster, which if, if you will ask any hydrogen researcher what the public thinks of hydrogen, they'll say Hindenburg. It's actually not really true. So when, if, you're, if you go out and do surveys of what people think of hydrogen in the UK, for example, and people have done this, what they found is that people are quite interested in the idea. They're quite open to the idea. They want to know more about it, but they don't, they don't think that they're going to be sitting on top of a bomb, which is what actually a lot of researchers claim. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about the Hindenburg disaster and what actually caused it. I, I think the hydrogen all burned off in about 90 seconds. And hydrogen is very buoyant, so it tends to go straight upwards at high speed. Also, you can't, you can't see hydrogen flames. They're invisible. So what you can see there is something else burning. Um, anyway, but another place that hydrogen is used a lot was in the Apollo programs and in, in spacecraft in general on the right-hand side. When, when you see one of the big rockets launch, you're not looking at hydrogen. You're looking at jet fuel in the first stage. But at the second stage and the third stage, they use liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to provide pr propulsion. But today, we're interested primarily in cars. So the, bi the big interest in hydrogen in recent years is from fuel cell cars in particular. You know, nice, sleek, quiet, no emissions, badly parked. They do all of it. <laughs> and so there's a question, why fuel cells? Ooh, hopefully this is going to work. Ooh, and we have no sound. So a fuel cell looks like this. You essentially put hydrogen and oxygen into it, and we get an anode and a cathode out. Um, so you go, they go through the anode and cathode, we get water out and we get electricity generated. Fuel cells can be up to about 60% efficient rather than 30%. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can actually provide that hydrogen. Lots of different uses for the fuel cells. So there's lots of, we'll come on to that a bit later. Um, one of the interesting things about fuel cells is that they're scalable. So you can go from very large uses to very small uses and they have the same efficiency. They're the only electricity generation technology that can produce the same efficiency at, at, at all scales. But most of them lose efficiency as you make very small versions. But what a lot of people think about is very green hydrogen, which comes from renewables. Is then So you have renewable electricity that then goes through an electrolyzer to produce the hydrogen, which has no, no emissions on the entire, um, on the entire cycle. And, and that's seen. That's a vision that many people have of what hydrogen could be in the future. And so we get the hydrogen economy, or the green hydrogen economy. And that, the term hydrogen econ economy became widespread in the 1970s, and several visions have been proposed for hydrogen fuel cells in future economies. So for quite a few people think of hydrogen as a really clean energy carrier. It's really the only energy carrier other than electricity, which doesn't have carbon in it, that, that we foresee using in the future. Anyway, maybe ammonia. So a few people have talked about ammonia, but we're not going to put ammonia into people's houses because it's toxic. You might, you might be able to use it in shipping and in industry and places, uh, maybe even electricity generation. But essentially, we're down, we have choices of, hyd of hydrogen or electricity. Electricity, you can generally do more things. It's a high-grade fuel. Hydrogen is easier to store, and, and you can make it more cheap. So you have the, these trade-offs. So, but a lot of people think of hydrogen as a clean energy carrier. And, and they think of it being produced from sustainable or renewable energy sources. Uh, so low, low carbon. And that's where the green hydrogen comes in. And there's, there's huge arguments of what green means. Does it mean renewable? Does it mean low carbon? And people have been arguing this for electricity, the same way for electricity, for many, many years. And there's still no. Every, every country has a different definition. But other, thing, other ways that people have had, other visions people have had for hydrogen could be reducing import dependence and creating a more secure energy system. So this is particularly in the US where they look at import dependence on oil and see that's a really big issue. And they, they, they look at hydrogen as a way of having domestic energy resources that will reduce energy imports. 
Now, it's, it's very controversial uh, whether import, reducing import dependence actually increases your energy security. There's a lot of evidence that it doesn't make much difference. But that's a different conversation. Other people look at particular sectors, so they, they foresee hydrogen in the, in the road transport, or they foresee hydrogen supporting renewable electricity generation. So, it, so for example, if you have excess generation for times of low demand, then you, you, you produce hydrogen with that rather than just losing the electricity. Or, or uh, they see decarbonizing gas heating as well, kind of going back to where we started. And if we want to think a little bit about hydrogen, where it's gone, then we need to think a little bit about the hydrogen hype cycle. And so this is a graph of the Gartner hype cycle. You have time along the x-axis and you have the visibility of the technology on the y-axis. So we start off with the technology trigger down here at the, at the start of the time, the start of time for the technology. And this is when it first becomes famous. So pe people develop the new technology and they say, isn't this great? This is going to change the world. It's got all, it does all of these amazing things. And you know, the media becomes very interested. People set up companies, money goes into research. And a lot of hype builds up about it in a, in a fairly short space of time. And so we go up the hype cycle until we reach the peak of inflated expectations. And at that point, what we find is that we still don't have a, a product that's commercially viable. It's too expensive. It doesn't work well enough. We've had a lot of money put into a lot of companies. So we're thinking about the tech, the tech boom type of thing. And a, few, a number of those companies go bust. I mean, that just hap that happens with any new technology. And then people become disillusioned. They say, we were expecting great things. We put money into the companies. They all went bust. It's never going to work. And, that, and so that's, we then start going back down the visibility curve into the trough of, dis of disillusionment. And then at that point, people, people have kind of forgotten about the technology. They think it's probably never going to work. It, it was yesterday's idea, which was a good idea, but isn't, wasn't practical in reality. But while, you, but while you're down there and through this whole process, what, what you did in the first place was to train a lot of people to understand the technology. And you still have a few companies that survived who continued to develop and develop and develop if it was a good idea. And those, those people will work for the new companies. They will keep the networks that they had going. And eventually, they will overcome the problems. But they'll do it in their own quiet, quieter way, which is much more realistic than it was in the past. And so... We then head uh, to the slope of enlightenment, which is kind of sounds great to me because I'm an academic. That's what I'm meant to do, uh, enlighten. And, and at that point, then we we have much we're much more realistic about the potential for the technology, but we're also getting to the point where it's becoming economically viable, becoming commercially viable for the first time. And so we head up there, and then eventually we get to the plateau of productivity, which is when you actually start making and selling the thing, and when it might actually take off. So this is the Gartner hype cycle, and we've seen this hype cycle for a lot of different technologies. So if I put on where I think we are for hydrogen, we started in about the late 1990s when hydrogen became quite a big thing. And then, and then probably around 2002, sort of the same time as the tech boom, we, we hit a peak, a peak of inflated expectations. But, and, and since then, it's been a little bit downhill. Um, particularly when electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, have taken a lot of the limelight and a lot of the headlines in recent years. And so a lot of people have looked at battery electric vehicles and hydrogen, ve hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and said, you you're either trying to pick one or the other. They're seen as competitors. And, and hence a lot of people would say, well, the battery electric vehicles have won. And so I think about 2013, say, we got to the trough of disillusionment. And now somewhere where... Somewhat, we're now somewhere heading up the slope of enlightenment, pro probably more towards the bottom than the top. So do fuel cells work? How are, how are they designed? Are they safe? And would you want one? There's a, a few general questions that people will often ask. So all fuel cells look a little bit like this on the right-hand side, all fuel cell vehicles. They have a tank, in this case with hydrogen. Normally it's compressed to 700 bar, 700 atmospheres, so really, really high compression. Uh, because hydrogen is is a very um, is not a dense gas, and if you don't do that, you don't have enough in order to get the range that you want. So we tend to build these tanks out of carbon fiber. They're, they're really really strong, and and they have to go through a lot of safety tests. Out of that tank, we then supply a fuel cell, which produces which generates electricity, and that powers an electric motor, which powers the drivetrain of the car. 
all hydrogen, all commercial hydrogen vehicles are hybrids. So they all have battery packs of various sizes. So we also have some batteries here which also can power the electric <coughs> motor. In some cars, they've actually set up the fuel cells, so the, the fuel cell charges the batteries, and then the battery powers the electric motor directly. So the fuel cell never actually isn't connected directly to the motor. There's different ways of doing it. There's lots of different ways of setting up your car. But fundamentally, these are electric cars. They have electric motors. The only difference is between a battery vehicle is that in a battery vehicle, the battery provides all, all, of, the, all of the energy, all of the electricity, whereas here we have a fuel cell that also provides electricity. We tend to use proton electrolyte membrane fuel cells, PEMs, in these cars. Um, the reason we use them is that they have quite lo low operating temperatures, about 90 degrees, um, which means that you have a little dribble of water comes out of your exhaust um, rather than gas. But also, they're, they're exceptionally good at ramping up and down in power levels as, as required and, and at high efficiency which is what you need when you're, when you're using a car, because you get to a junction, you, you stop, you, you, the light goes green, you speed up afterwards, and so your, your power output of your engine has to ramp up. And they're very good at that. Um, I talked a little bit in the f a few slides ago about f fuel cells being uniquely scalable, and even small cells having very high efficiency. I mean, that's really great. So uh, as, as an example from Arcola Energy, I, mean, I did promise a car. So this is a fuel cell car. Which, which they make out of Lego. So it's powered by these. This is, a, this is a hydrogen stick, as they call it. This is actually a metal hydride hydrogen stick. So, so it's filled full of metal, and when you pump hydrogen into it, the hydrogen reacts with the metal and adsorbs, and then when you open it up, the hydrogen will come out again. Um, we, don't t we don't tend to use these in cars because they're too heavy. So in, car in cars, we, we tend to simply compress the hydrogen in a very strong tank. Here it's not compressed. But it's, that's, a, that's a hydrogen tank. As you can see, it's quite safe. It doesn't leak. Um, <clears throat> and you can build a, a little car like this. So this is a fuel cell here. This is a 2-watt fuel cell um, of the type that you would use to charge a mobile phone. It's, this is probably the cheapest, one of the cheapest fuel cells you could buy, certainly in terms of the size. So, so the power densities can vary quite a lot between different fuel cells. This is very large for 2 watts. Um, for comparison, a car might have a 100 kilowatt fuel cell. You can imagine if you had to make this that much larger, it would take your entire car. Uh, so then they have a much higher energy density. This is the exhaust pipe here, which gets the water out. Uh, this is a little 2 watt engine at the back under here. And theoretically, if I try, it, would go, it will work. Now, in reality, we do have some fuel cell cars being commercialized. So at the minute, you can buy two fuel cell cars in the UK. And this is as of last. The, the, these became available for the first time last year. We have a Hyundai iX35, which was the first commercially available one, 101 kilowatts. I think it, it wasn't until about the third generation of this car that they made them commercially available. And, and even then, their mass production was about 1,000 models. So it was still quite quite small, but it was the first hydrogen car that went into a mass production factory that essentially wasn't built by hand. Um, and that was the first one that came out globally. The Toyota Mirai has had a lot of publicity in recent years, so that's 113 kilowatts, and that's also available. And the Honda's fuel cell Clarity, Clarity fuel cell car, is going to be released later this year. So at that point, we'll have a whole three cars in, in the UK uh, that you could officially buy. So you have to ask the question, have battery vehicles already cornered the market, I think? Because worldwide, there's already 25 pure electric cars, so only batteries uh, um, powering the elec an electric motor that you can buy. And even within the UK, there's 70 different types of plug-in cars and vans. So when I say plug-in, that, that means you could have a car which has a, a petrol or a diesel engine, but also has an electric motor and has some batteries as well. And it can run off either the engine or the motor. Um, so it could be that they're all hybrid cars, so they will have regenerative braking, but they, will, they could also be plug-in hybrid where you can charge them at home, run off the batteries for the first few, few miles that you drive, and then after that you need to move to the petrol engine when your batteries are empty. And also we've been, been building infrastructure in the UK for battery vehicles. So we have more than 15,000 charging points for plug-in vehicles. And so, it, and so electric vehicle sales do continue to grow over time. 
and that they're running at about 6,000 a month. But it's interesting that hybrid vehicles have been dominating, not pure electric vehicles. And actually, sales of pure electric battery, battery electric vehicles have reduced recently. And so there's a, there's a question about why that is, and I, I really don't know the answer. Um, but even, so there's, there's fewer sold in January 2018 than January 27, in January 2017, even though there was more electric, a lot more electric vehicles sold in January 2018 in total. So there's a question about whether people are not happy with the operating characteristics of the battery vehicles, of the pure electric vehicles. This is quite a famous, in the scientific world, quite a famous little chart comparing useful transport energy derived from renewable energy. So it was by Ulf Bussel in 2006 in a paper called Does the, Does the Hydrogen Economy Make Sense? But what he, what he did was to say, let's start off with 100 kilowatt hours, 100 units of electricity from renewable sources. What proportion of that can we actually convert into, dry, into useful energy for our car using different powertrains. So on the right hand side we have electricity um, and so, uh, or battery vehicles should I say. And so essentially you charge you for your batteries uh, and then you get down to your vehicle and it's about 90% efficient, the electric motor, which means you end up with about 69 kilowatt hours, so 69% efficiency, 69 kilowatt hours of your original 100 kilowatt hours are used to provide motive force for your vehicle. If we then look at hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, over on the right hand side here, we have two different routes. So on the far, sorry, on the left hand side. So on the far left over here, we have, we have uh, gaseous hydrogen. And in the middle here, we have liquid hydrogen. So there's two different routes that you might supply and use a fuel cell vehicle, okay? Well, fuels, you can't put liquid, uh, hydrogen directly into a fuel cell, you'd always have to gasify it, even if it was liquid, stored as a liquid in the car, but fortunately it gasifies at minus 250 degrees, so that's not a problem. It's quite, it, it happens automatically. But what we find is that we convert, the electro, we convert the electricity into hydrogen using electrolysis, that gets, that loses us it's about 29 units of our original 1,000, and then we have various um, steps where we need to compress the hydrogen and transport it and put it into the fuel cell and then go through the motor is the final step. Or we need to liquefy the hydrogen, transport it, put it in the fuel cell and go through the motor. And so we end up with 19 kilowatt hours for the liquefied route and 23 kilowatt hours for the, hydro for the gaseous route at the end of the day out of our original 100 kilowatt hours. So 19% and 23% which is a lot lower than 69% efficiency. And so Ulf Bossel's argument is, why on earth would you invest in, would you use hydrogen cars when you should, if you look at the basic efficiencies, you should, you should uh, only use battery vehicles. Now we can, we can be a little bit picky with some of the numbers. So we might say, if we're going to use an electrolyzer to produce the hydrogen, we do it at a refueling station, so there is no transport cost. So chop out that 80% efficiency loss there. You know, and we could argue with three little bits and pieces. So all, all, all hydrogen cars are hybrids, for example. So why, why, why does this one get regenerative braking and these two don't? But still, in the grand scheme of things, the argument still stands that it's, 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 uh, these, are, these two are only a third of the efficiency of this one. And so what, what I would do, what, what I'd call that efficiency on the previous graph is the powertrain efficiency. So it's the efficiency uh, of the motor force that, that comes through your car. But actually that's not we're, what we're interested in. If we're interested in running a car, we're not interested in the powertrain efficiency. We're interested in the vehicle efficiency. And the vehicle efficiency is how many kilometers you get for a given amount of energy at the start, okay? That's, so that's quite different to powertrain efficiency. We measure this in kilowatt hours per kilometer, not, in, not, not as a percentage. And the vehicle efficiency depends on the weight of the car, fundamentally. And that's important because battery vehicles become increasingly heavier as the number of batteries increase. So if you want to have a very, sh if you're happy to have a very short range with your car, you don't have many batteries in the car. If you want a longer range, you need to increase the number of batteries uh, in order to increase the distance it can travel in one go. But if you do that, you'll increase the weight. And pretty quickly, the, the majority of the weight in your battery car is the actual batteries themselves. And, and that's really important because 
if, we, if you want a, a long range car, then you can keep adding batteries, but you, you eventually get some, to uh, something called mass compounding, where actually the more batteries you add, the less extra distance you get, and at a certain point, if you add more batteries, you'll actually reduce the range of the car because the weight out outweighs the extra energy that you've got for storage in there. And so you end up with a graph that looks something like this, where your, your electric vehicles are, but, are much more efficient if you've got a very short range, but as you increase the range beyond a certain level, they become less and less efficient. Whereas hydrogen vehicles and today's internal combustion engine vehicles are much less sensitive to increasing the amount of fuel that's stored on board because the fuel is much lighter than it is in batteries. Um, so if range is an important thing, then maybe it's not so clear cut the differences between battery vehicles and, and hydrogen vehicles, and fuel cell vehicles. And also you have to think that a lot of vehicles we have are really quite heavy. So you get into, for, for example, uh, heavy goods vehicles or refuge vehicles on streets or even very large cars, family cars. The larger the vehicle becomes, the, the more difficult it becomes to use batteries. If we look in the long term and think about what the costs of these technologies might be, uh, this, this is a graph I produced in 2014. Um, and the idea was to compare the total cost of ownership of all of the different powertrains. So, so, so this is for a, a scenario where we meet our two degrees targets. And so we have carbon taxes on various fuels over time, which is why the gasoline ones become more expensive. The, the diesel ones become more expensive over time. Uh, what, what we see, and this is assuming that we have innovation in all of the technologies, which brings all of the prices down to a mass production level. Okay? What we see is that all of the costs lie somewhere between around 50,000 and 70,000 pounds. There's a lot of crossover. And, and frankly, the uncertainty in all of these costs is far larger than the difference between the individual costs. So if you, are, if you were to ask me what's going to be the cheapest technology um, 2040, for example, 2030, 2040, if we, if we can mass produce all of them? My answer is I have no idea whatsoever. And anybody who tells you otherwise is guessing. So, so one way, if, if I was going to in, try to interpret this, I, I might say that I think we'd use battery-only vehicles for city cars because they're more efficient. And for long-distance cars, for large cars, for family cars, maybe we'd have hydrogen plug-in hybrids. Because remember, hyd hydrogen has batteries anyway. You fit a few more and put a plug on it, and it becomes a, it becomes a plug-in hybrid hydrogen vehicle. Um, but of course, that could change if we have technological breakthroughs, and particularly on the battery side. So if, if, for example, lithium air batteries could be made to work, and they have a much higher energy density than existing lithium batteries, then that, that could really tip the balance, because you could then greatly increase the range of battery vehicles um, you might also want super fast charging, of course. At, at the minute, you can, super, you can supercharge a car in about 30 minutes to do 100 kilometers, which is fine. But even if, you, if you're going long distances, that might be quite a pain. It will be quite quick. It won't be long before you're stopping for another half an hour and then another half an hour. And, that, and so you probably need something even faster than that. Hydrogen vehicles are essentially like existing vehicles. You go to a refueling station. You, try, you fill up the tank in three minutes, you drive for 300 miles, you go to another refueling station for three, for three minutes. So they're, they're the kind of the business as usual option. There's a, there's a number of other markets that have been um, growing for hydrogen. So it certainly fuels um, forklift trucks. They're becoming very popular in the US in warehouses because they can go for eight or 10 hours without needing to be recharged. And when you do, when you do need to Refuel them, it takes three minutes as opposed to leave, leaving them to recharge overnight. And so you get much higher usage factor out of your forklift truck. And, be, and, because you can, and that's also because you can't use petrol vehicles within warehouses because of emissions. Um, depending which way you came today, you could have come on a hydrogen bus through London if you went on the RV1 route. Uh, there's a fleet, I think, of six buses in London which have been running for quite a while now. And they've been running very well. TfL are very happy with them. And in the longer term, we certainly think of HGVs. Hydrogen is one of the few options to decarbonize HGVs, and maybe even trains. This is a hydrogen train. They have been developed uh, using fuel cells. Another area that's been getting quite a bit of interest recently uh, in the UK is hydrogen for heating. Um, 
Now, interestingly, heating is actually by far the biggest global market for fuel cells, not transport. In, about, in Japan, there's now about 225,000, I think, uh, as of last October. There's about 225,000 fuel cell micro CHP devices that have been installed in people's houses, which generate electricity and provide heat for the house. Um, so there's been a huge growth there. In comparison, there's only a few thousand vehicles uh, being produced. And we can see what, how this has happened. Essentially, the Japanese governments decided that they were very keen to promote this technology and, and uh, promote innovation in it. And so for the first few, they had a, a Japanese industry shakeout they, uh, with the idea to reduce costs over time. So you can see how they reduced from 2007 down to about 2011. Uh, on the on the blue line, oh sorry, that's Korea. Uh, any farm in Japan is the green line. You see, it was about 2004, that makes more sense. To about 2007, they brought them down and then they started actually putting them into competitive markets. And, and the prices have continued to drop and drop, so they've started about 200,000 pounds per unit and they're now down below 20,000 pounds per unit. And that's been achieved through year-on-year -year growth plus targeted investments and innovations. Uh, within the country, uh, and some interesting ideas. So, for example, if anybody is given a contract for research under this, this program, they're required to share all of the insights that they get from their com with their competitors. Uh, and while there's been, there's been several companies involved in building the fuel cells, and they do compete with each other, they also uh, help each other. They collaborate quite a lot because they, they see a bigger picture of selling them globally. We have also started putting them into Europe, as you can see, but we have far, far fewer. This is a logarithmic scale up here. So we, we have less than 1,000 at the moment. By Europe, you could write Germany, because almost all of them are in Germany. Within the UK, there's been quite a bit of interest in hydrogen for heating, but partly because the, the, the plan before that of using heat pumps has proven to be quite difficult. Um, because we worry, first of all, we worry about whether the electricity system can cope. So here we, sh here we have the gas demand compared to electricity demand in blue. Uh, the gas demand is in orange. And you can see there's a very high winter demand and a much lower summer demand. And both are much larger than current electricity demand. Electricity actually varies more between the peak, evening peak and the overnight low than it does between seasons at the moment. And so we worry about whether the distribution networks will, will melt with, with the higher load, whether we can generate enough electricity uh, for the winter peak at a low enough price, et cetera, et cetera, with heat pumps. And, and an alternative that's been uh, suggested, um, which is really this, this, report, this report at the top left, the Leeds Citygate H21 report, had a lot of pu publicity about this, is to instead use hydrogen. So to convert the gas, natural gas networks, again, and having a similar conversion program to what we started off with in the 1970s. But instead of going, uh, whereas in the 1970s we went from town gas to natural gas, this time we'd go from natural gas to 100% hydrogen. Um, and so the, the Leeds report looks at what the feasibility of doing that would be. And it's kind of a business as usual option. <coughs> It's, you can see it as a business as usual option for homeowners with, um, <coughs> with uh, who've currently got natural gas heating because essentially you have a drop-in boiler which does exactly the same that your current natural gas boiler does except it doesn't produce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And we are actually looking at this in quite some detail. So uh, BASE, uh, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and Ofgem they're investing more than 30 million pounds between them in feasibility studies uh, based to look at what happens with using hydrogen within your house and developing hydrogen boilers, looking at standards, and Ofgem to look at the gas networks themselves and what changes you might need to make to use hydrogen in the gas networks. There is an open question about whether we would use gas boilers or fuel cells. So I, showed, I showed on the previous slide where Japan is using all fuel cells in that case, powered by natural gas, because they have a built-in reformer which converts the natural gas into hydrogen. Uh, but at some point, if they move to a hydrogen grid, then they could throw away the reformer, which would make their fuel cell a lot cheaper. So every, every, everybody would be happy. And we could use either in this country, or maybe a mix of both. 
You know, people have also done studies where you looking at whether you could use fuel cells to balance off the electricity demands from heat pumps, if we had heat pumps in some houses. So all of these technologies, although they're notionally competing, they can actually be used to balance each other off. When a lot of people talk about hydrogen, they think about what is the, how are you going to produce the hydrogen? Is a question you get a lot of times. So how are you going to produce low carbon hydrogen? We've already talked about producing hydrogen from renewables with electrolysis, which absolutely works. It's absolutely the, the most environmentally friendly approach, and it's also the most expensive approach. And so it still leaves open the question as to why you'd want to do that if you can just use electricity directly in heat pumps or in battery electric vehicles. But there are lots of different ways of making hydrogen, similar to there being lots of different ways of making electricity. So we, the main way that we make it worldwide is through natural gas. We reform the natural, we have st steam methane reform as they're called, um, to produce natural gas, produce hydrogen from natural gas, and that's used to make ammonia in the Haber-Bosch cycle. That's probably 50%. Essentially, any, everywhere that has natural gas uses natural gas. A few places that have dams uh, can use, often use electricity, and everyone else uses coal or oil um, to produce the hydrogen. In the future, you would need to use carbon capture and storage. And there are some interesting designs as how you, how you, how you could either build an extra module on, on the side of your steam methane reformer to capture all of the CO2 or, or just redesign it all together in a cleverer way to, in order to capture it as part of the process. Then you need to worry a little bit about how you get it from the production side to the point of use. And you've got pipelines that could do that. You could send them through tube trailers, which essentially is a trailer with a bunch of gas canisters on, which is similar to this one on the back, which you drive to a refueling station. Or if it's liquefied, you can put it in a road tanker, similar to the oil tankers that you see today. So there's several different ways. And you have to think a little bit about how clean you want your hydrogen to be, how pure, or what compression you need it in different places, if you're going to store it. If you need it at 700 bar, you don't want to compress it from 2 bar, because that's very expensive. For example. So you really want to feed a refueling station from a high pressure pipeline rather than a low pressure pipeline. So there's, lot, there's lots of issues about that. There's lots of different options, as you can see on here. I want to mention power to gas very briefly. So power to gas, the idea is that you generate the hydrogen using excess renewable electricity, so that power is not wasted at times of low demand. So this assumes that you have a lot, a lot more renewables on the electricity system than we have at the moment, probably more than 60% for, for it to really make a difference, 60% of your total generation from renewables, according to the sums that we've done. The economics of this really depends on the cost of the electrolyzer and the capacity factor. So how, the capacity factor is how often you're actually using your electrolyzer. And one, one issue is that the more electrolyzers you have, the lower the capacity factor of all of the electrolyzers. Because the amount of excess varies over time. And the more electrolyzers you have, the, the greater amount of the excess that you get. But each extra bit of excess happens for a smaller and smaller period. Um, and, and so you can only justify having a certain number of electrolyzers on your system. And we've done some sums to see how much hydrogen you could actually supply to the UK using power to gas from excess renewables, how much of the demand you might supply. So let's assume for a moment that within the UK, virtually all of the transport sector is supplied by hydrogen, all the road transport, and all of the houses are supplied by hydrogen for heating, which I talked about in the previous few slides. At that point, if we had about 80% renewables on the system, our, our excess renewable electricity could be used to produce about 10% of all the hydrogen we needed, and about 90% of the, of the hydrogen we'd need to produce using other technologies. So this is not some sort of um, golden kind of get out, get out of jail way of producing all of the hydrogen that we would need if we were using a lot of hydrogen. It's interesting, it certainly could use we could certainly produce some hydrogen. It would make sense if we were going to produce hydrogen to use it as hydrogen rather than trying to use it as power to power storage and turn it back into electricity when we needed more electricity at, at times of high demand and low supply um, because the turnaround efficiency is very low. If you convert it to hydrogen, convert it back to electricity, you're better using batteries depending on the time scale. So you can, you can store hydrogen for in very long periods at very low cost, but you can't do that for using batteries because batteries are too expensive. 
but essentially it's not going to change things. And you can, you can see here how the cumulative installed capacity, most electrolyzers historically have been alkaline electrolyzers. We've been building those for 100 years quite happily. But you can see the PEM electrolyzers, similar to the PEM fuel cells, are becoming much more common in recent years. Again, that's because they're very good at switching on and off to generate, um, to produce the hydrogen according to what your load is, which is ideal if, you're, if you have excess renewables uh, generation. That's varying over time. So five challenges I think there are for hydrogen fuel cells. The first one is to fund innovation. So the only way you, the only way you really bring down prices for these types of technologies is through learning by doing, to reduce fuel cell vehicle costs. Um, I gave an example of that for the fuel cells um, for micro CHP in Japan, where they where they pulled the price down, but they did that through installing a couple of hundred thousand so far. And the same thing would be needed for fuel cell vehicles. You, you need to encourage people to actually um, try different methods of producing them and such like, and do that through in order to reduce the costs, and that requires investment. Uh, chicken and egg infrastructure is an issue, so whether you make the chicken or the egg. Um, so, so do you build the do you build the infrastructure first, or do you build the um, do you get the vehicles first? You have to build some infrastructure, but actually studies have shown you could build 60 small refueling stations in the UK, and that would cover about 80% of the population. It would cost 60 million pounds, which, in the grand scheme of things, for the transport sector, is actually a drop in the ocean. It's a lot of money, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to what we generally spend. Uh, working out purity and compression requirements for different applications is tricky, and how they, inf uh, how they affect infrastructure development. Um, a general problem is that it's expensive compared to high carbon alternatives. So unless we have a carbon tax, we'll never be able to justify building alternative vehicles. And also, maybe in the longer term, new demand patterns, such as driverless vehicles, could really change how we use vehicles, and that could really change the economics. So to summarize, what happened to the hydrogen economy? Uh, the, the cars are being belatedly commercialized, and there's a lot of other technologies being pursued, but I think there's a lot more reali realism now than there was in the past. I think the key drivers are going to be economics, user experience, and air pollution. Um, and personally, I think it's very hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the longer term, not least because hydrogen fuel cells, they can contribute in many diverse ways across many sectors, which span the whole energy system. So just to finish by thanking you for listening. Uh, thank all of the authors, particularly of these four papers here, um, whose work I used quite a bit. And we have maybe a minute or two for questions only. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a microphone here. Hello, uh, my name is Kim Leeper. Um, I was reading in the Telegraph uh, over the weekend about a company by the name of High Tech in Redmond, Washington, who uh, is very interested and has developed some technology of um, recognizing that commercial vehicles uh, are going to be the big um, problem in any kind of hydrogen economy, and they have developed, I believe, some injector technology to convert um, normal commercial di uh, diesel engines into a hydrogen-based fuel system. Are you familiar with uh, this company and this uh, concept? I'm not familiar with the company. Uh, there is a company in London that's done something similar, so you can convert I'd, you can convert internal combustion engines to run on hydrogen instead of petrol or diesel. It's, uh, BMW did a similar thing a few years ago when they had liquid fuels. The trouble is that the internal combustion energy efficiency is only about 30%. The fuel cell is about 50 to 60%, which means you need twice as much fuel to go the same distance. So BMW went for liquid fuel instead of gaseous fuel, but then the liquid fuel boils off and has all sorts of problems. So nobody's doing liquid fuel anymore, and that's why people want fuel cells. Um, so if you have a short range, it can make sense. If you're happy to have a short range, say for vans, which is the ones that, the ones in London that have been converted are all vans. Um, but long distances, it doesn't work as well. Uh, we have we have time for one more. Yeah. It's not a competition, electricity or hydrogen, but I'm just interested in this whole question of the AC/DC thing. 
does that have an impact on the relative efficiencies or with all the different processes of using electricity to produce hydrogen? Um, you're going to have some, you'll have some losses in the transformer, uh, but I, I don't imagine they're very large. I mean, this transformer is 90, 95% efficient. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how people are going around trying to, I'm not sure whether people are trying to um, use different engine designs to try and pick all AC or all DC through the system. I guess it's a possibility. But I'd have to talk to my electrical engineering colleagues. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid we, ha we don't have time for any more questions. So I'm happy to try and answer one in person. Uh, thank you very much all for, for coming.